Uh, well, welcome everybody to this special lecture on vocational education. This is the, the culmination of, I think, five years uh, in which Alison has been uh, chairing the uh, project. It's a mic on. I wasn't sure it was on. Oh, I see. Was it not working? I have to actually speak into it. I see. Okay. Um, this is a special lecture on vocational education. Uh, really delighted to have Alison here to talk about this hugely neglected area of our national life. Um, she is actually one of the very few public figures who have really championed this sector. And um, she has made actually uh, a huge uh, impression uh, by what she's done. So first in, in 2011, uh, she was invited by the government to do a report um, on vocational education, in particular the proliferation of uh, endless qualifications. Uh, she then sat on the Sainsbury and the Orga reviews. And since 2018, she's had a really interesting job, uh, which is to advise the prime minister uh, on uh, vocational education, uh, sitting part-time in number 10. That doesn't mean that they've done everything she wanted them to do. <laughs> uh, but they have done a lot of things um, entirely because of what she uh, was pressing for. So uh, she really has achieved big changes in policy um, and I think even bigger changes actually in the, the, the language. So it really is remarkable to have uh, it being said that the Prime Minister's top priority is skills. This has never happened, I think, before in, in British history. Um, Alison is the Sir Roy Griffiths Professor of Public Sector Management at King's. Uh, she's also a crossbench peer in the House of Lords, uh, which I, I was thinking about the phrase, it doesn't mean that you sit on the fence. In fact, quite the contrary. <laughs> um, so Al Alison, really looking forward to your talk um, about what I think is probably one of the half dozen biggest problems uh, facing our country. And I, I really liked your title, The Paradox of Vocational Education. Alison. Um, thank you, Richard. I hope you're right that um, it has that the, there has been a real change in the last few years. People talk about skills a great deal. Um, I'm not sure how optimistic I am always about this following through for in expenditure because, um, as I think everybody in this room will be aware, when when it comes to the moment when Treasury is making final decisions about spending. It's not some, it, it should be about principle. It's, it's often about a large number of other things. And the other thing I should say before I start is that everything that I say tonight is in a totally and completely personal capacity. Nothing I say should be in any way taken as um, reflecting what the government has done, is doing, or might do tomorrow or next year. So, okay, shall I go? Right. Okay, why don't I do this? Is that better? Um, so anyway, yes, I, I think it is a paradox, and it's what I'm going to talk about tonight, because we do all talk about skills. We talk about skills, the economy, productivity, ad nauseam, and yet vocational education remains the poor relation. If you want to write something that gets media coverage, you write about universities. If you really want to get media coverage, you write about something that involves Harvard or Oxford. Oxford's even better than Cambridge. I've never been able to quite work out that, why. You don't write about skills. You don't write about vocational education. And yet it is at the heart of everything that modern governments agonize over, partly because one of the things that they feel they have to do is to take responsibility for the economy in a way that obviously in the past people did not. So, hmm, this worked earlier. Let's try. 
No. Nope. It wouldn't go, this wouldn't work. Well, let me just go to that one and then go to, okay, will it work now? Can I still use that? Yeah. Okay, so. No, then I can't move this. Um, I'll just, I'll speak up as though there isn't a microphone and hope that works for all the people on Zoom as well. Um, I'm not quite sure how to find out if it does. Is that better for people in the room? Okay, I'll just project as though I was without a mic. Um, so this this is my question. And, and it is actually a very interesting question because we are obsessed with the economy. We are obsessed with productivity. We are obsessed with the government's role in guaranteeing this. And we do actually, for in, in much of the world, have constant and genuine shortages of important skills that employers are very willing to pay for or that society or the economy really wants. So in this world, the most striking feature of the last 50 years is that what has exploded is higher education enrollments. This is very, very obvious if you look at developed countries, but what is often not so obvious, even if you actually live and work in a university, is how rapid and how recent this has been. Just, just the last quarter century, for example, the average proportion of 25 to 34 year olds across the OECD who have completed some form of tertiary education has gone from 27% to 48%. If you look at the rest of the world, if you look outside the rich club of the OECD, what you find time and time again is that if you look at an emerging economy and you look at the enrollment rates for higher education today and you compare them to the enrollment rates for higher education in a comparable OECD country when it was at the same income per head, the enrollment rates in higher education in universities in emerging countries will be far, far higher than they were for countries like our own. And there are two drivers. The drivers are government's belief in what is commonly known as human capital theory, which is that one of the, the main drivers of growth and prosperity is the, the quality of education and the, the education and skill levels of the population. And that has been a firmly held belief that if you want to get prosperity, send more people to university. If you want to get prosperity, send more people to school. And, and of course there is some truth in it. So governments have believed that. But what is also true is that the populations of these countries believe again with very good grounds that if they want to be prosperous and to succeed, and if they want their children to be prosperous and to succeed, higher education, university attendance is incredibly important. And just to give you a sense of the long durée, just of, well, not really, I mean, a little more over, a little over a century. Um, when, you, when I show this graph to people, they tend to think at first there are only two columns. And then you look and you notice that actually there's a third very tiny column, a very tiny bar. And that is university student numbers in three countries, in France, in Germany, and in the UK. And... The, 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 the column on the right is when you take out international students. So this is a complete transformation. Now in 1900, people went to school. A lot of people didn't go to upper secondary education, which is now in the OCD universal, but almost nobody went to, to university. And so we have gone in a very short period of time from a world in which almost nobody attended university to one in which it is the absolute norm for middle-class children and increasingly the norm for a very, very high proportion of the world's population. And of course, one of the things that this means is that governments are spending a large amount of money on this and that's, this tends to make them ex extremely interested in what universities do and how they operate in a way that they were not, that was not the case before. We 
all tend to be more aware of our own graduation rates than we are of anybody else's. But just to give you a sense of what it looks like, I thought I would put up the percentage for a number of key OECD countries. And these are the 2021 rates from, from the OECD. And what is interesting is that even in countries which we think of, and I'll come back to this in, in, in a little while, even in countries which we think of as, as not particularly university oriented, these numbers are actually very high. This is tertiary education. So even in Switzerland, which actually has, in my view, one of the very finest apprenticeship systems in the world, over half of 25 to 34 year olds have now been to some form of tertiary education. In Germany, which is still one of the lowest, it's already up to 36 and carrying on up. And interestingly, the, the USA, which used to be the world leader, is now a fairly ordinary country in terms of college attendance. Now, in the process of this incredible change, which is encapsulated by, by those figures, the whole nature of higher education has changed. And so is the nature of the higher education debate, the way we talk about higher education and the way that governments talk about higher education. Some of this is particularly marked in this country, but it really is not it is not specific to this country. As higher education has become bigger and bigger and bigger, as governments have taken on more and more responsibility for, for the economy, as universities have become more and more of a charge on the public purse, which is, which is large, you know, even in countries, again, like our own, which have loan systems, politicians and the, the, the whole you know, the, 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 the policy environment has become one in which universities are discussed increasingly and indeed almost entirely in terms of their relationship to the economy. Now, sometimes this is long term and people talk about blue skies research, though even then it tends to be about the blue skies research, which a century from now is going to transform the physical world in which we live. But in general, and again, I do want to emphasize this, this is not just this country. If you look at how people discuss education, or higher education around the world, they discuss it in terms of the economy, the contribution of university to the economy, and they use as their indicator to a very large degree, the wage returns to a degree. How much more does somebody earn if they go and take a degree than they would if they hadn't? Now, this is particularly evident in the United Kingdom because we have particularly good data. Um, so this means that we tend to get engaged in incredibly specific, well, politicians do certainly, incredibly specific conversations about whether or not people should be doing this degree or that degree and why do the returns seem to be higher in Manchester than they are in, in, in Liverpool and, and, and this degree of detail. And we have the, the, the longitudinal education outcomes data and that's unusually comprehensive and unusually well known. And so in this country, politicians on, of all parties focus very heavily on wage outcomes, salary wage outcomes, on employment outcomes, and also on what they see as low quality education, which is defined as education which doesn't produce high wages. Now, that's a little simplistic, but it's only a little simplistic. And that, as I said, is, is particularly clear here, but it's by no means unique. And just to give you an example of um, how this pans out in, in, the, in the education world, this is sort of a top, it was, slightly at, ran, it was slightly random that I picked on Aston. I mean, there was a reason why I was thinking about Aston on, when I went in to try and find somebody's website. But you, this, this could be true of, 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 of any website, pretty much of any university. So here is Aston. It is selling itself to the world through its website. And right up there, at top level, we have the 2022 LEO data shows that employed Aston University graduates have the 16th largest median salary overall five years after graduation. Now, that is not a sentence you would have seen on a website 50 years, well, there wasn't a website, but this is not a sentence you would have seen anywhere in the, in the literature about a university 40 or 50 years ago. So what is it that, what is it that drives it? And, and 
was it really ever thus and it just only applied to a few people? No, it wasn't ever thus. Um, certainly it was not ever thus in terms of, of universities. And so when I was preparing this lecture, I went back to a couple of sources, um, one which everybody has heard of, but mostly not read, which is Newman's idea of a university. Um, and the other was a very well-known 19th century novel, which I constantly <laughs> happened to be reading. And it brought home, both of these bring home how, how dramatically things have shifted in the way that we think about higher education. And I, and I will come back to skills in a minute, because what is clear here is that this is actually a skills oriented view of higher education. Higher education is increasingly seen in terms of either its immediate contribution to people's wages in the labor market today, or in the case of research, in terms of longer term benefits to society. Now, those are not bad things. And, you know, um, why wouldn't one want oneself or one's children to do better in life? But it is a profound shift towards a, a single purpose view of higher education, which was certainly not evident in the 19th century when obviously far, far fewer people went to university. And in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the idea of a university was, 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 was very different. That didn't mean that it didn't have any vocational role because universities have always trained priests and lawyers, but they did also develop some very distinctive characteristics. And Newman, the idea of universities is, is, is famous, though I think it's also something which has to be, which is quite hard to read today because a lot of it is justifying the fact that there should be a university in Dublin which taught Catholic theology. Um, and that bit is sort of, you know, this is not a raging debate for us in 2022, so you have to sort of skip those bits. <laughs> um, but he was making a case then very strongly against an alternative view, which you would have to say today appears pretty much to have triumphed. And his argument was that the process of training by which the intellect instead of being formed or sacrificed to some specific trade or profession, is disciplined for its own sake, is called liberal education. And this, this is the, the term, the liberal term, the, the idea that went into liberal arts colleges, liberal education, which continues to have some influence, but which I would have to say, I don't think I have ever heard a, politician in recent years give much more than very cursory lip service to. Um, I don't know that if you put most politicians up against the wall and said, do you really think this is completely pointless? They would of course say, no, of course this is important. Of course this is important. But, and, and then there would be the but, and we would go back off into the preoccupations with how universities do or don't provide high quality vacation, vocationally relevant education. And, in the, the thing I would recommend to you if, you, if you are inclined to read this, is his discussion of the fact that then too, there was a raging debate about whether or not education should be in any sense for the sake of the intellect, as, as opposed to the sake of immediately recognizable and quite confined trades or professions. And his particular bet noir turns out to be um, not just the people of that time with whom he was engaged in debates about um, utilitarian education, but actually John Locke, who according to him was the preliminary, profit is perhaps the wrong word, popularizer of the idea that the question to ask of a university is what is the real worth in the market of this article called a liberal education? So the view that, that, that Newman had already then was that this idea was both valuable and under attack. 
The other thing which is very interesting is if you just read novels of the time again, is that it brings home to you that the, the discourse of the time was very, very different. Newman felt he was fighting this battle, fighting to protect and put out into the world this, this, this idea. Um, Cicero, by the way, was his hero. Cicero, again, apparently, I mean, I, I said that, the, that human beings have a need for knowledge and that the, the thing that they need and that they will always follow as soon as they're no longer hungry and cold is knowledge. I'm, I'm not sure that's true, but um, anyway, Newman, was, Newman felt that Cicero was his hero and, and, and Locke was his villain. But it's also very interesting just to read the novels of the mid 19th century and to be reminded both of the good and the bad side of this, because what comes out very clearly is how very much a liberal education was seen as the mark of a gentleman and the tradesmen, the manufacturers yeah. were by definition not properly educated and really quite to be quite to be despised. And it's, it's I, I would really recommend this novel, by the way, I'm enjoying it, I've been enjoying it enormously. It's a very famous novel and it's about, it contrasts the North and the South of, 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 of England. And of, there's a, and it's actually a novel of ideas, but it has a, a sort of a, a love story with a hero from the North and a heroine from the South, and they have very different views. And um, this, is, this is Margaret, the heroine, when she first moved to an industrial manufacturing town, which is, I think, basically Oldham. And her father had had a crisis of faith and had left the church and gone to work as a tutor up in the north. And when he first told his staggered family that this was going to happen to them, and that there was an opening for a private, for a private tutor who would teach the sons of the manufacturers some classical education, some literature, his educated and protected daughter said, a private tutor, said Margaret looking scornful, what in the world do manufacturers want with the classics or literature or the accomplishments of a gentleman? And then later having met Mr. Thornton, as for Mr. Thornton being in trade, why he can't help that now, poor fellow, I don't suppose his education would fit him for much else. So this was a view which basically was that the top rated education was stuff which was very clearly without any immediate relevance to, to manufacturers. Now, of course, the North gave as, gave as good as it got. And um, the view in Milton, which I think is basically older, um, according to the prevalent and apparently well-founded notions of Milton, to make a lad into a good tradesman, he must be caught young. If sent to even the Scotch universities, that's their word, never mind Oxford, he would come back unsettled for commercial pursuits. So boys are placed in work from the age of 14 to 15, unsparingly cutting away all offshoots in the direction of literature or high mental cultivation. And um, then somebody else remarked, so there were some wiser parents and some young men who had sense enough to perceive their own deficiencies and strive to remedy them. Now, the reason I pull out these things, not just from Newman, but from a completely sort of randomly selected 19th century novel, is that this view of education for good and for bad has vanished. And that brings me back to my, to my puzzle, which is that, um, on the one hand, we feel vocational education has, is neglected and nobody takes it seriously. And yet at university level, it might seem that vocational education has triumphed, that we have moved to the view of the Milton parents that if you send a child away for education, I mean, you don't want them to waste their time on stuff. These days, of course, they can go to university and learn some, some useful stuff. And, Governments want that, that's what they're preoccupied with. And actually most students want it too. So if you look at um, what people mostly take at university, it is highly vocational. I mean, you know, Cardinal Newman would not like these statistics. They would horrify him. Because the, what I've done there is I put the percentage of UK tertiary educated adults, and you know, if I took young people, the, the, the difference would be would be would be greater, who have who are whose whose studies were in these particular fields. I've put a few I've put the OECD average on the right, and you'll see that in most cases, except for education, we're actually pretty pretty similar to the OECD average, and then a few a few exceptions down the middle. Um, and for those of you who know the Italian or Greek 
um, university systems, this probably won't surprise you that they are the outliers where there are still lots of arts and humanities students. Um, and equally, there are more engineers in Germany and Austria, but, but not that many more than there are in this country. So most people in most universities, in most of the, in, in, in the OECD are taking vocational subjects. They are taking subjects which they think will indeed be highly relevant to them when they are in the job market. But outside the university, the opposite is happening. So we have a conviction that education is for the labor market. We have a concern very reasonably among parents and students with skills that will be relevant. To a, a large extent, you could say John Locke has won. And yet outside the university, vocational education is not on the increase, rather it seems to be in decline, not just in this country, but, but generally. And for many years, the, the view in the United, in this country was there was a, a considerable literature, which argued that one of the reasons that the UK economy was so poor was that we hadn't always failed to provide high quality vocational and technical options at secondary level. And the perceived cul culprit was people like Margaret, um, an elite Southeast culture which despised industry. And, you know, one of the classic examples was the, 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 the argument that in, after 1944, there was a very famous education act which set universal secondary education on its path for the whole country and visualized a tripartite system, including some, some a, a, a middle level high quality technical system and some technical grammar schools were indeed created. And they vanished, they were closed down by the treasury. The general view is that they were fell victim to the prejudice against vocational and technical education in this country, which I suppose is true. I mean, but, but what actually killed them was that the Treasury found them extremely expensive and there was no powerful counter lobby. So I suppose you could say it's both ways. And since then, the, 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 the United Kingdom as a whole has, has not gone down the path of trying to create specific institutions that teach technical and vocational content at a high level in the secondary school system. Instead, we've had an ever an ever growing list of more or less successful or more or less failed qualification focused reforms. But what I want to bring out here is that, you know, in the past, and, and with good reason, I think, we in 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 the UK and, and also actually often in the United States would draw contrast with other countries which had highly structured school-based alternatives to an academic university oriented route, typically in separate institutions. And so, you know, the, the argument was that these were, these were highly respected and they showed that other countries took this option much more seriously. And look at us, we have never took, taken it seriously. We've always thought that education was to create gentlemen and look what happened to the technical schools. And these systems were very effective once, but today they are in clear decline. And I think that this is, well, I don't think I'm, I'm quite, it's quite clear that the, the, the decline of school-based vocational education is very closely related to what I've been talking about earlier, which is the explosion in higher education. So before asking what's going on, I'm gonna give you a real whistle-stop tour of Germany, Netherlands, and France. And I will massacre the, the well, what I will give is, is, is such a compressed view of their, their education systems that I, can I please apologize in advance to anybody here who's an expert on German education, Dutch education or French education, because I'm gonna compress like crazy. But Germany is a country which has a hierarchical system in secondary school, and there are different institutions and they lead to school leaving certificates which have different implications. And the Abitur is a university entrance exam and you get it at the gymnasium. And for a long time, basically people you know, if, if you go back, people went to the gymnasium and then they mostly would go to university or they went to the, um, it is not a vocational school, it is a, a, a folk school, a general school, it's a, a, the school for the mass of the population. And they would get the Hauptschulabschluss and then they would mostly go into apprenticeships. And what has happened in the last few decades is that the number of enrollments 
has shifted and it has shifted very markedly, if you like, upwards. It's shifted in the sense that more and more people, though still only um, a small minority, this is all German job holders. If it was people who are now in their 20s, the, the proportion with an abattoir would be much higher. But there's been a huge increase in the number going to gymnasium and a huge increase going to the, the middle school, the Realschule, which is, which is not seen as essentially for people who are clearly going to go into craft type apprenticeships. And this is a very, very strong trend, and it is shows no sign of letting up. And in Germany, as well, the, the, the apprenticeship system does hold up, but many of the people who get good apprenticeships now will have gone through the Realschule, they'll have gone to the gymnasium and had an abitur, and the old general education, those schools are clearly in decline. The Netherlands has an even more complex and hierarchical set of set of schools, and again, it includes a voc used to it includes and 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 has always included um, always in the twentieth century has always included a vocational track, and this these actually schools were actually more overtly vocational than was the case in Germany, where they were essentially a basic education for which you went into apprenticeship. And they were the schools which traditionally educated the children of the artisans, and, and they had enormously positive press, and many countries were encouraged to, 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 to try and open them. These two are seen now as increasingly as sink schools, they're for immigrant children, and they're rejected by the skilled working class. And and this is a quote from um, Lehman Sahaso. So what you get is you get the grammar schools at the top, you get two more things in the middle and at the bottom the vocational schools have become um, schools for lower vocational training and in a considerable number of cases they are entirely for the children of immigrants. So what about France? Well France is always quite interesting because it has a more centralized system so in some sense it's much more like us and again all the typical things have happened more and more people take the baccalaureate so you create three sorts of baccalaureate you have the general one which is top prestige you have the technical one which was very much constantly trying to create a high prestige technical one and then you have the the back professional which is more vocational. Um, about 15 years ago, there was an attempt to introduce a differentiated curriculum in what in our case would be, I suppose, um, 13, 12, 10, 9th and 10th, I would say year 9 and year 10, um, to have a more what was called a technical option for children who were basically struggling. There was such resistance from parents that it was abolished. They were determined to keep their children in, in, the, in the same general, general track, but then they do get separated off for the final three years at Lise, and many of them will then go to a, to a, 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 a vocational high school. The French have also tried constantly to create high prestige, technical qualifications, which will provide a prestigious alternative to, to university. And in the 1970s, they created something called um, IUTs, um, University Technology Institutes. And these actually give us a clue to what is going on and also some indication of how, if at all, you get out of it. Um, because these institutions were first a failure and now are a success, but not quite in the way that anybody actually intended. So they were intended originally to enroll 21% of all students in higher education. The argument was by creating these, you would create a prestigious alternative to university, people would flock to it, and they would exit after two years with the technical qualification and go into the labor market to become technicians. And by the late 1970s, after 10 years of doing this, they were only enrolling 7% and they were seen to be failing. But then in the late 1990s, their popularity and their enrollment shot up. And it's quite interesting to understand why that happened. So let me start with two, two students. And for many people, you will feel that what you've got coming is a sort of prisoner's dilemma argument, and I'm afraid it is. <laughs> So you've got two students, you've got student A and you've got student B, and they have to make a decision when they're 18 or 19 um, about which course they will do. And if they take a traditional degree, they 
might do very well, but they might actually not do very well. They might end up with a degree, with all the costs associated with it, years out of the labor market, quite possibly not very, very practical technical skills. So high cost and very variable returns, but those include the best returns. So you could get a lot out of it, or you could find you hadn't got very much out of it. If you take a short technical degree, you are more confident of what will happen, but you also know that, the, that you, you can't make it to the top. You're basically putting a lid on your, on your aspirations. At the age of 18, you're going to make a firm decision at that point that you're going to take a technician award, and therefore a technician is what you're going to be. And in that situation in France in the, in the 1970s, what happened was that on the whole, people stuck with university. So they, student B took a high cost traditional degree. And in France, the, the fees are quite low, but you don't get any maintenance support to speak of. So it's not, it's not costless. It's not free in the sense that you get wonderful support. Um, so student B would make this calculation and opt for the traditional degree and student A would opt for the traditional degree. And that would mean yet more overcrowding, yet more increase in the number of people doing full degrees, um, frustration on the part of the state. It's not quite as bad as the classic prisoners dilemma. Nobody's actually going to prison, but, but it's, you end up with a, a high cost option taken by, by, by everybody, which has got very variable yields. So, this is a classic prisoner's dilemma situation in a way. I mean, it would make a lot of sense for society if more people would do shorter, cheaper courses for which, which involve skills for which the labor market is often crying out, but they don't. But suppose that what happens is that you actually, First of all, you make the IUTs highly selective. And secondly, you give them a guaranteed progress on to the third or fourth year of the university degree. Well, what happens when you do that is you transform, you transform choices. And so what has happened is that once, as you can see in red, going to the, the, the low cost option, also allows you to automatically switch through having missed in the case of France, the first few years of the university degree, which are the least well resourced and where loads of people fail. If you do that, you may then at the end of two years indeed exit with a technician degree, but you can also move straight over into year three of the university, which is a much better place to start university than it is to start at year one in the French system. And basically that was what happened. And therefore sort of, not quite overnight, but the, the, the place of the IUTs in, in the education system was transformed. They became highly oversubscribed, very popular, competitive to get into, and increasingly populated by people who were actually quite high achieving on, on academic scores. So they, 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 they do now fulfill part of the original purpose, but they are not, a clear route through for people who are not high academic achievers. And what they underline is the rationality of young people's choices and the way that they will look for ways through the hierarchy. So where are we? I mean, the thing I would like to underline is that um, we are now in a situation where we have actually just very recently tried to create specialist institutions. And um, we're in a situation where 16 to 18 participation is near universal. And we've got schools and we've got FE colleges. But we have had an experiment with what are called university technical colleges, which were the brainchild of, of Lord Baker. And he essentially wanted to create very specialized vocational schools for 14 to 18 year olds. So people would start at 14 and they would choose their, their, their vocational specialization at 14, go through to 18 and then go on to, to university or to, to an apprenticeship. And 60 of those have opened between 2011 and 22 and 13 have closed and three more have changed from 11 to 19 entry. A few of them have been hugely successful, mostly those which have a close link to say Rolls-Royce or JCB an engineering company. But essentially we have had exactly the same experience as the French did when they tried to create a new 
technical track in the equivalent of the GCSE years. Basically, people did not want their children to go to them. They did not want them to make irreversible choices at the age of, of 14. And so the, the UTCs have struggled. And in January 19, which is the last overall number I've got, they were basically operating overall at 45% capacity. And that I think is, is, is it's, it's, it's very similar to the, the story I've just told for the IUTs. So here we are, we are in a modern labor market. We have huge skill demand, often for mid-level skills, not for advanced physics. Or we have average wage returns to degrees falling inevitably when lots more people go, the average returns like to fall. But at the same time, those, the gap between graduates and those with no qualifications. And we also have high returns to advanced craft and technical skills, including specifically apprenticeships. And looking at Sandra McNally here, some, some of the, some really, really good work has been done here at LSE, which has actually indicated that in spite of this country's valiant attempts to destroy apprenticeships, the ones that survive are still, con have still been continuing to, to, to yield very, very good outcomes for the people who take them. Now, in this, in this modern labor market, where we've got huge numbers of people going to university and clear oversupply in many ways of what were, what were formerly seen as, as graduate skills. I mean, people coming out of higher education will have hopefully learned a great deal, but if you just do a sort of um, central planning alignment of job opportunities and numbers of people coming out of university, you find that, that we are not actually generating a labor market in which 60% of the jobs clearly need three or four years of advanced higher education. So faced with ever more credentialed applicants, employers use rules and rules of thumb for ranking people. And the, the, the concern for people, for parents, is that degrees are increasingly seen as a gateway. If you don't have a degree, you won't actually be able to, you won't get anywhere near the shortlist. The, 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 um, the employers will simply go, fine, that's enough. We will we'll only look at the graduates. And what, is, what, what this means, of course, is that particularly for some institutions, you get some, some and, and also to some extent for any degree, you get what economists would call rent. Um, which is the extra income that accrues the owner of a factory production over and above what is needed to, to make it active or bring it into production. And what I mean by that is something very straightforward. Um, when you get to the point where a degree is basically being used as a precondition for ever being considered for a job, and people who don't have it, who could do that job equally well, are not considered, then the degree holder has some rent. And increasingly, employers perceive and select not just on the basis of a degree, but on where you got the degree from. And so again, our particularly sophisticated analyses in this country show that your future wage advantages are very closely related to where you went. Now, that may be because we do a wonderful job at LSE or King's or Oxford, but some of it, in my view, is clearly because it's a signal to employers that that somebody was first of all good enough to go there secondly they finished the degree there therefore they're worth looking at and it's not sensible to do a huge amount of extra work and discover whether or not somebody who went to a lower ranked university is in fact as good as somebody who went to a higher ranked university and so this is this the the, the dynamic that this sets up is made worse by the fact that if you are in a modern company you are under a lot of pressure not to hire people because you knew their cousin, but to use objective criteria. And no one gets sacked for drawing up an all-graduate shortlist, and graduating from Harvard or Yale Law School won't count against you if you're a Supreme Court nominee. So does this matter? Actually, yes, it does matter. It, it does matter because this is actually neither just nor efficient. And if we sort of come step back a bit and we talk and we think about the, the both the skills that people need, the skills that the labor part, part market wants, the, the, the nature of the education in which people thrive, and the fact that we have actually that we are actually moving at this point in setting life chances to an incredibly one-dimensional way of selecting people, which 
at one level seems to be utilitarian in the way that, that, that Cardinal Newman hated, but at another level is clearly not because there is a lot that you don't learn in a university. University is a very particular sort of environment and they are very expensive for the individuals. They're very expensive for society. And there are costs for individual employers because actually a lot of the people that they are hiring will not in fact have the sort of skills that, that they actually want. But I think that the, the, what we have to actually recognize is that we have a set of underlying drivers, which we, we cannot easily put in reverse. And the real problem is that if you, if you rank everything on a single dimension, half of the people on it are going to be in the bottom half. And that is just going to be true, whatever you do. So, are there any countervailing forces or policies? Um, I think they are, but I think they have to, to recognize two things. They have to recognize the determination of parents and people to keep options open as long as possible for their children and themselves. You cannot, in a modern society, revive good vocational non-university education if in so doing you seal off routes for progression and alternatives to the future. People will not do it. They just won't do it. And that means that if what we're trying to do is to create environments which develop vocational and technical skills in a really good way, and you know, I have another lecture on you know, why universities are really bad at teaching a lot of skills <laughs> and a lot of attitudes. But if you want to do that, then, then what you have to do is you have to set up something which is a clear alternative, which has its own prestige hierarchy and is not claiming to be the same as a university and you just go from one to the other. You've got to create an alternative set of, of, of options and they have to have their own prestige and their own hierarchy. If you have a hierarchy of higher education over here and you have vocational options over there, which are all the same, then people are not going to go for them because this is a competitive world and people are very aware that it's a competitive world. And yes, you want your base quality to be good, but however you set it up, people will look for and want ways in which they can advance. Now, I don't mean that this means that some education has to be rubbish. And I actually believe very strongly that if everybody is well-educated, we will have both a better society in many ways and a more productive one. But you cannot ignore the, the, the competitive forces which a labor market generates and the fact that individuals want to do well in it. And one of the things which has driven me mad over the years actually is politicians of one party after another getting up and announcing that their, their ambition is to make school-based vocational achieve, education achieve parity of esteem with academic because that's not how it works. You don't go, you know, 50% on, on, a, on a, an extremely difficult maths test is exactly the same as 50% on a big assessment. I mean, you just, you just don't. Um, the world out there is competitive. People feel it to be, they feel it to be hierarchical. And what you need to do is you need to create something which is alternative and has its own internal structures and prestige. And, I think there are two things you can do about this. And one of them, one of them, I think for us, this ship has largely sailed, which is to have, not in this case, particularly the French IUTs, but you can have selective, highly specialized technical institutions, which are for older people and which are very clearly just fantastic and that to get into them really matters. And the country I think which has done this and maintained it best is the Netherlands. But I don't actually think in the current environment in the UK or indeed the US or Canada or, in, or many, many countries that you can do this. You have university structures which are now big, widespread, well understood and trying to just push specific, specific extra specialized institutions into them as hard. Um, you know, the most obvious exception to my rule would be Dyson, but it's, it's a university, it calls itself a university. But that came out from a from a um, from from a company. But what I think you can do is I think you can go back to the future if you like. And I do think that 
it remains the case that an apprenticeship route can and should provide a genuine alternative because it is different. It is different because it's not just a form of classroom education. And it's different because it involves for individuals who do it, an, a, an involvement in firms where the prestige of the apprenticeship bluntly will always be related to the quality and the prestige of the employer, but that need not be large companies. It can also be small, highly, highly competent cults, countries. And because it doesn't pretend to be just another form of formal education, it can, and in many cases, it does provide an alternative to an increasingly hierarchical higher education system. So I'd like to stop there. Um, it is a paradox that as we get more and more obsessed with the vocational outcomes of higher education, all over the world, we are finding that our old vocational preparation systems are disintegrating. I think the only way that we can prevent this, and, and, and it is, it's bad for people, it's bad for society, it's bad for vocational skills. The, the only way that I actually think we can progress in the future is to truly embrace reviving apprenticeships in those countries which, where they've declined. And I wish the very best of luck to the people in countries like Germany and Switzerland, where they are aware that apprenticeship is often not as secure as it used to be because parents feel that their children should go into higher education. And to try and really become aware ourselves and to broadcast to the world that this can be a phenomenally successful preparation for life and career because it is not university. It's something completely different. Thank you. Oh, that's lo that's lovely. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, a, a splendid conclusion, which I, I completely agree with. But uh, I wondered if I could draw you out a bit more on how, in our, our situation, um, we could bring this alternative route to have that kind of automatic progression, which we have down the, the, the sixth form uh, A-level uh, university route so people knew that if they go down this route they understand the steps and can expect to progress if they qualify to the next level um so so, so what one question is you know how how are we going to get a proper supply of apprenticeships since the apprenticeship levy was introduced the supply of apprenticeships for people under 25 or certainly for certainly for people under 21 i think even under 25 has gone down. Um, so how are we going to get that uh, redirected? Um, have, we, have we got um, an instrument of government that can promote uh, apprenticeships? Um, because these companies are, are, are not wanting to spend their money. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's a real challenge, Richard. I mean, I, I, I absolutely do. I think that um, this is something where governments do have to recognise it and they do have to be prepared to put in money and not just exhortation. I mean, um, the, the, the intricacies of our unique and peculiar apprenticeship level, I think that's something we'll go into here, but um, I think there are two things that you have to have for a successful system. And one of those is that the government has to be prepared to put some money in. This is a system which is a, in many ways a, a genuine public good. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, this is something where the state needs to, to, to contribute and not simply expect the employers to contribute. And um, that is fully recognized in, in Germany where the state pays for the off the job element, which takes very seriously, and the employer for the for the on the job. So I think that's the case. But I also think that the the, the challenge, which is why I think we have to we have to keep we have to keep trying. But I think it is a real challenge because it also 
means that you need the institutional underpinnings. And this is something where I sometimes feel that people who have successful apprenticeship systems don't realize how, how fragile they are and how much they rest on institutional relationships among employers and, and, and between employers and the state, which you can't just take for granted. So um, I actually think you, you can't in a modern society recreate this if you don't also have organized employer networks and, and chambers of commerce or something like that to which the state is willing to cede some power. And I think that is the, the biggest challenge that, that you know, we, and, and again, it's not just us. I mean, the Americans have had various sort of um, frustrated and frustrating attempts to, to grow a friendship which have gone nowhere. And, and I think it is something where you have to, 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 to create local institutions and that the, the, the ingredient you have to restore to the mix is shame. <laughs> you have to make people ashamed if they don't take now, you know, of course, there have to be sort of financial aspects as well. But I, I, I mean, I do think it's a challenge. I mean, the one thing I would say is that um, whereas back in the 1970s and 1980s, many people saw apprenticeship as an outmoded thing, something which actually was, an, it, it stood in the way of efficiency. Um, and it was it was unfair you got an apprenticeship because your father had had one and you know really we should just bring everything back to defining the skills people need ticking them off and then now you go into the workplace with your 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 list of skills and everything will be super efficient and we did try that here and it didn't work but i do think that that the big challenge for governments of the next decade who are serious about apprenticeships and you are right that, that everybody now Everybody now, I think, genuinely believes in them. They may not believe in what's needed. They may not agree with me about what's needed to take it further on. But I, I do think that it needs not, it needs two things. It needs more government money and it needs some genuine government activity to promote the resurgence of employer infrastructure. And once you've got it started, then I think it, it, it then grows of itself so I think it's a huge challenge and if we don't do that I'm not optimistic mm. could I, I want to ask one more question then I'll shut up um uh, obviously if we were to try and apply the Robbins principle to this separate sector that you're trying to build the Robbins principle says if you're qualified you should expect to be able to continue that's the case mm -hmm. down the academic route it's not the case down this route um but you still have to have a mechanism for making people qualified because a lot of, a lot of people come out of school without in, enough qualifications. So you need a, 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 a stronger FE system in which people can qualify for apprenticeships. And I wanted to ask you, I mean, you, you did a, a tr tremendous uh, thing in getting the, the lifetime skills guarantee that makes it free but there has, there still has to be a place. Still has to be. So, so, so uh, as you know, um, uh, I, I've been trying to raise this issue of, of shouldn't the funding of FE follow the same principle as the funding of the academic route, that oh. the, the money automatically follows well, I, I the students? I personally think it should, but I have uh, to say this is not the policy of any political party in this country, as far as I know. No, well, <laughs> how are we going to get it? Um, <laughs> I think I might hand that one back to you. <laughs> you okay, Let, let's, let's, uh, who, who wants to go on? Yes, Andrew. A lot of schools have a teacher who is uh, the careers officer, which is ridiculous because most children leaving school aren't actually going into careers. Sorry, could you, could you speak up a bit? Sorry. Uh, is that better? Yeah. Yes, yeah. much better. Um, then they're not careers officers because most children aren't going into careers. They are what they need guidance is what do they do next? And I would guess that 90%, 99% of people who are careers are people in schools went through the degree route and have know very little about this other route and are certainly not champions of it. Indeed, they a lot of them are. Ken Baker will tell you that a lot of these people in, this, in the schools discourage P 
pupils from moving into his type of school because they want to keep them in their own school. So there's some big work to be done with them. The other thing is someone, and it could be the LSE, could organize a jamboree for 30 year olds, two groups of 30 year olds. One has been through the conventional three year degree and gone on from there. And the other went the apprenticeship route and they can talk to each other and say, well, how did you get on? And one of them said, well, I've got this degree, but I've had a series of jobs. I've got no relationship with an employer and I've got 50,000 pounds of debt. And the other one says, actually, I've got a, a strong relationship with my employer. I'm in their kind of management chain now and I'm getting promoted um, and I haven't got 50,000 of debt. And, and the first one was, oh, blimey, well, why didn't someone tell me that before I started? Um, right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a partial answer to that. So that, you know, give it, but, um, I think on careers, it's, it's, it, it, you're, you're right, of course. And um, when you ask young people where they get their careers advice from, which what they take seriously, they very, they get the, their careers advice to come back down the road down the minutes. Um, but of course, what you're right about is in a, in a school, people will give advice on, on, on what they know. And there is now new legislation coming in again through the indefatigable Lord Baker, which will force schools to get wider advice coming in. But I actually think there are sort of two things here. I think actually, most of the survey data shows now that people are very keen on apprenticeships, which goes back to Richard's point, that we just don't have the, the, the supply. And the, the, the prestige is, is quite high, and it's, a lot of it is, is supply. But I, but I also think that, yes, what we ask people to tell the world about is, is, is very important. Um, I'm not sure that I want to add any more formal um, key performance indicators to schools' lives, but but what I do think is important is that anything we talk about in terms of destinations should should make this clear. But I, I think the other thing that I, I also agree with, with Richard about, and he'll probably want to say something about this, is that um, if, until we can achieve something that is simple to understand and easy to follow, we will not succeed. Having something which is complicated and depending on professionals to then explain the complications and on individuals to find their way through it, I, I think you, you make very limited progress that way. So, Richard, I'm, I know you feel very strongly about this, that, mm. that, that um, people, it, that the roots need to be simple as well as publicly celebrated. Martin, you, you've got some questions uh, from the, the great audience online, which we haven't said hello to, but uh, hello there. <laughs> yep, uh, a couple of questions from online here. Um, Tony Gallagher asks whether another way of referring to the specialised technical institutions would be as polytechnics. No. <laughs> and I'll tell you why, um, because, you know, no, I, I don't want to exaggerate this because um, you can preserve this to some extent, even though there's always tension. And again, the, the Dutch have preserved their politics. But um, I actually think that ship sailed in this country. I don't think you can, I don't think you can put it, put it back. And there was always a tension associated with this, because if you go back to why we got rid of the binary divide. That's also a very, it is, um, there was a lot of pressure from the polytechnics themselves to have wider offers and be recognized as universities because that way they would be much more attractive to not just home students, but to overseas students who wanted to go to a proper university. Um, and even before the, the polytechnic university divide in this country ended, they were increasingly doing other things. And, and I also remember an anecdote told to me by a um, journalist at the time about going to visit a, um, a, an independent school that was not, not top rank. And, and when the, the Polytechnic University divide was abolished, um, the head teacher said it was a wonderful day. He would no longer ever need to tell any of his parents that their child was not going to go to university. Mm. Um, so I actually think you can do it up to a point, but if you go back to my IUT diagram about, you know, people would only do it when it was very clearly not going sideways. 
Um, I think you can do it with highly specialist institutions because they are instantly recognizable as super specialist, very high prestige. I don't think personally that the Polytechnic University divide works very well. The Dutch are fun in there, but they're quite unusual. Uh, another <laughs> online question um, from an LSE alumni, Anthony Valian, who asks um, that academ academics have tried to make a case for arts and humanities on the grounds of uh, skills and economics. Uh, but despite doing this, the government's focused on STEM subjects and they could get make a case for them on intellectual knowledge and societal the grounds. Battle rages in government about whether whether we have too many creative creative arts students. Um, but the current climate, this is what I said at the beginning. Um, you know, I, I, you need you need Cardinal Newman up here to make to make some of these arguments, not not me. I mean, all I can say is that within government and and it, well, actually, within within Westminster, it isn't just within government. Um, the the argument is so so confined to measurable outcomes. And as I said, I mean, in in the, in the gov in government's defence, when you are actually spending spending as much money as most governments do on higher education, it does tend to lead you down these these, these paths. But um, when people are defending the creative industries and their need for um, lots and lots of students, given that the wage returns tend to be horrendous, um, they always make this defense in economic terms. They always make it in terms of this is one of the industries in which, you know, this is an industry of the future. This is somewhere where we are world leaders. You, you, you've got to have this. And um, other than that, what you do find time and again is that it's not just a prejudice in favor of, of, of STEM and maths on themselves. It, it, it is something where the, the data tend to feed into it. Um, and it is parents. I mean, another, th you know, I, I work in a business school. One of the things we do is we offer joint degrees with quite a number of our humanities departments in order that people's parents will allow them to do a degree which has a humanities half <laughs> on the grounds that they're coming to us for the other useful bit. I actually don't think it's that way around necessarily at all. But but this is a this is a this is a tough one to crack. Uh, I think Martin's next. I probably shouldn't ask this question, but I'm going to anyway. It's actually two parts. Um, we are in the middle of what looks to me like a rather unstable um, process because- you, Can you they, hold it up, Mark? Sorry, you young people are entering a lottery for good positions in society. The number of people entering the lottery is growing much faster than the good positions in society. So the expected return on average is falling rather sharply. Um, surely that will end before the number of young people who feel they have to go to universities has reached 100%. And if it has, how does it end? It does. And the second question is, isn't an alternative way to your apprentice route? No, I'm not saying that the apprentice, but an alternative way of fixing the problem if, is if everybody has to go to something called a university and get a degree, why don't we put all these courses in universities and call them degree subjects? Well, the second question is because actually universities aren't very good at technology. We actually want to get really high quality outcomes, so the apprenticeship will do it much better in those places. You don't really want your doctors and nurses who do actually have apprenticeships to education, but all their time sitting in, in, in classrooms. But the point is that a lot of the, the, the reason apprenticeships work so well is they're actually, if you like, very expensive, personalized form of education um, and that they can be in a way that a mass system cannot but going back to does it end yes it does end and actually which i think you know the united states is a good example of where it has flattened. um and it, but what you end up with in that situation is a situation where the average return to college has got a lot lower 
but the gap between some college and nothing has also got much bigger. So I think you're right that it's somewhat unstable. Um, but, and of course it will equalize at some point and where it equalizes will be a function of all sorts of local factors and family factors and costs and so on. But where you end up is not somewhere where I think any of us would really want to end up. Could I, could I just add mm. a historical point? Um, I mean, this, this same falling of the returns happened after the big expansion of the 60s and early 70s. Uh, the, the returns fell, and the result was that demand for higher education was flat for a decade or longer, and the same thing will probably happen, happen this time. Um, I think it probably, I think it probably may, but it, it has to be said there are countries in the world where it's got a lot higher than ours. So I, I think it probably will flatline. And again, it will depend on a lot of things, you know, to be to which is licensing, to be fitting alternatives. Um, so no, I don't think any, I don't think we're heading for 100%, but I do think we have a system which, can I just add one other thing, which is that um, this lottery, one of the things which, you know, again, it's hard to, to um, it's, it's hard to say the cause and effect and, and um, there are lots and lots of reasons that, that make people more or less happy or unhappy. But um, I think young people do feel it's a tremendous strain. And this is, um, and again, not just from the UK, uh, young people are in many countries a lot of the time not very happy and they do feel under stress. And, and, and I think that's very understandable. Andrea? And then this, oh, yeah. I thought Sandra was sort of following up on oh, this. Okay. Yeah. No, I just wanted to ask. Um, so, Alison, I think what, what I, I imagine you, you might be saying is that after people finish their level three course or something, they can, they can do an apprenticeship and that would be an alternative route. And then if they subsequently decide they want to go to university, then they can get their loan entitlement and go to university at that point. So it wouldn't exclude that option necessarily. But the way that apprenticeships are set up in England aren't really, they haven't been set up with that in mind. So you have a lot of apprenticeships that wouldn't fulfill that role and um, they're very, very narrow um, and they, they wouldn't be um, very extremely narrow um, and, uh, and therefore they wouldn't fulfill that at all. Uh, and also you have a lot of people currently doing apprenticeships who are, are much older than that um, as well and, uh, and maybe only doing a year. So do you... Would you uh, propose a system where you reconstruct apprenticeships, um, maybe in how they're developed in the first place and, and who they're for, in order to fulfill this idea about an alternative route? Well, this question of whether you should have apprenticeships for older people, I mean, we do have a very peculiar system because we are, again, I think we, we, you probably would know, we have a number of people who, who are supposedly apprentices who are actually much older, well into their careers, and, and the returns are much lower, of course they're much lower. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say that we should never, that, that you know, when you, if you talk to, say, somebody from Austria, they find this completely extraordinary, you know, how can you be an apprentice if you don't, if you don't start for your 20s? Um, I think that's too extreme in one direction. But um, I, I do think that, in a way, what I'm saying is that we, we need to think of apprenticeship much more clearly again as not just acquiring a list of skills, which in a way is the way we've, we've looked at it as sort of somewhat better follow on to, to MD Cubes, but, but actually to see it as, as, as genuinely a, a, a second route. Now, you might, it might be something you step onto when you're in your 20s rather than when you're 18. But I, I think the, the concept of, a, of an apprenticeship as, as being not just about the individual skill content, but about a, a, a range of experiences and a range of, of, of opportunities to, to develop very general skills and expertise and understanding. I think we need to put that back in, and not by making lots of lists which go, you know, did you do lots of problem solving today? How was it? But by actually thinking about what it offers, which is different from what university offers. Um, but just as university offers things which are not on the, the, the sort of the curriculum for what I teach in a particular class. So I think in university with apprenticeships, if we try, if we think about it as a discrete list of skills, 
which we have, and then that but the next piece that we've got lots of other places. But I, I think we haven't made that transition fully. We still think of them much too much as a sort of a list of skills to be picked off. Um, I have a question, but just to go back to Levy, and I'm in DFE, I'm not here to defend the government policy. I think we can overemphasize the Levy because they had a whole series of reforms. And when we say spending government money, it was a tax which the government does give back. It could give more money back. It doesn't give all the money it collects in the levy. But um, but I think if we if we got rid of the levy tomorrow and kept the other reforms that came in, I, I don't see the, the numbers growing uh, anymore. So I, I would worry if we just said the levy is the issue and don't think about other things about apprenticeships. That wasn't my, wasn't my question. My question is, I'm going to lots of talks at the moment uh, about soft skills, uh, the NFER with the skills imperative. I talk a lot, a lot about that and our schools productive board when we had uh, six academics in, bring up the softer skills, the, uh, the creativity, but not within necessarily the creative arts, uh, attention to detail, problem solving, teamwork, and everything like that. Are things other than technical skills. Um, my, my question is, is there a sense that academic, because it is more, you have more time and it is more personalized, is a space to learn to have an environment where more of those skills are learned. And that's important. And we need to think about how we can get more of those skills into the vocational side. Otherwise we'll end up with a very sort of narrow, less important uh, um, um, and less, less productive uh, courses as well. I would, just, I would say that most of those skills are learned much better in the workplace than they are in your average university, actually. <laughs> um, but that's, um, so I think people, people go up, I mean, people constantly talk about these skills and they are real. Um, but there are also things which you don't learn in the vacuum. You don't learn the creativity by having a creativity class. Um, and so, in a way, it's an argument for a wide variety of experiences and a wide variety of things that people for us to do it as a world difference. Um, I don't feel I have anything other than my disagreement with you that we need to worry about apprenticeship not developing problem solving or soft skills, which I would say the workplace on average does a lot better than your average university. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I don't know that I can prove my position or you can prove yours, but, but I sort of feel like we've, we've, we've talked about these things. I feel like but this is endlessly all my life. And, 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 and I'm not sure whether we've got them better or worse than we've gone through multiple rewriting of the national curriculum, multiple sort of, you know, asking us to create outcomes and this, that, and the other for any university course we teach. I haven't a clue whether we've got any better at doing them as a result. Richard. No, I'm not answering questions. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, I think we, we're, we're nearing the end, but have you got uh, one or two more? Uh, yes, Jeff Hayward asks, how can we create an infrastructure to support apprenticeships in a low-wage, low-skill economy? You said more of a low-wage, low-skill economy than, than most others. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a sort of vision of this picture of the United Kingdom, as um, maybe I'll just, people will disagree with me, as a sort of, you know, um, sweatshop hell. I mean, a lot of a lot of jobs are quite skilled. Many of them, of course, are many of course them, them are skilled in, and that's true of any modern economy, in ways which do not require a lot of formal training because they are calling on skills which most human beings have and most robots don't. So at this point, I'm going to go into my spiel about the care workers. I actually think being a care worker is one of the most difficult and skilled jobs on this planet. And having been a trustee of a care home, I know I would be completely awful at it. Um, but this then comes back to the question of how do you create and can you create um, an employer infrastructure, which means that people who work in these, in these occupations actually have a chance to progress if they're coming at a relatively low level and how you do that. And that I think is a real challenge. Um, I'm certainly not going to go into the is it going to become more low skills as AI increases. But what we do know is that apprenticeship was absolutely central to all European economies, including this one, 50 years ago. 
um, when about two thirds of 15 year old boys leaving school went straight into an apprenticeship and they weren't a engineering or anything like that the, the, the infrastructure was there and it was a it was a it was to do with some some incentives that they were cheap um was it a higher skilled economy than it is today it was like a lower wage one um I, I, I think it's hard. Let's go back to Germany. It is hard. I don't want to sort of duck the challenge. Germany has a dual economy. It has people who do high skill jobs and who have done high skill apprentices and it has a large number of people who do jobs which are not well paid and for which you don't need lots of formal training. I don't think that an apprenticeship system is going to completely transform any of our economies. But I think that it could offer at least a subset of people a, a, a better route than the university one and that would include some very highly qualified people and that in do, so doing it would generate not great not just greater life satisfaction but actually also greater productivity uh, i think probably uh, that's uh, where we where we, where we need to to, to, to end this. I, I, I was wanting to ask a question, but I don't know that you, you have an answer to it. <laughs> I don't really have an answer but, to Jeff but, Edwards' question. Well, I was told on the way here that the Times Educational Supplement has uh, dispensed with its further education correspondence. There is no major educational newspaper for further, which, which, which treats further education, and probably no broadsheet that, that, that does much of it either. Um, but, um, so, so, so yes, no, uh, that, no, that, no, that, no, that, 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 that's a background to my question. And my question is, really, how do we create a, a, a lobby for this cause? I mean, it is absolutely extraordinary, a matter of such importance has no, no lobby, there's no lobby, there's no structure at all uh, uh, pressing this this cause i, I have no answer I, I mean i'm 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 you know in the sense it's like how do we how do we create the apprenticeship infrastructure mm. um I, I have no answer richard i don't know how you do it <laughs> well, um, we'll work out one we'll, 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 we'll work one out over supper it back, people, people, <laughs> recognize it. people recognize it at one level yeah. but when it's a choice politically between putting money into FE and putting money into schools, schools win time and time again. Yep, yep. Well, it's, this has been an absolute treat. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, well, I, 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 I love the great sweep and then, <laughs> then how we've sort of come down to the way forward. It's been, been beautiful, lovely experience. Thank you so much, Thank Alison. You. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.